I'm Patricia O'Callaghan, and my idea of a great Canadian novel is Paul Quarrington's Whale Music. I love it because it's about music, it's very funny, it's poignant as well. It's about this guy, Desmond Howell. He's an aging former rock star, and his record company wants him to make a commercial album, and he is writing the whale music. It is his big opus, and it is a song to the whales. So I'm going to read you a passage that is in the voice of Desmond Howell, and it, uh, it gives you an idea of his house and the girl he's just found in his house. My house is high on a cliff, and from the edge of my property, pressed against the fence, barbed wire running along the top, eight feet in the air, I can see the ocean. From time to time, I will spy a pod of whales. They swim around the world, you know. Whales circle the globe purposefully. They lunch off the Isles of Scilly, stop for idle chatter near Monrovia. I feel very fortunate to see a pod, a family, sail by in the water beneath me. I love to see that. What I don't love to see is a naked body on my living room couch. It is a female body, by the way. What am I to do? Into the music room. I rewind the tape on the console, blast the song into the world octophonically. Yes, yes, this is lovely and I must dance to the whale music. I throw off my bathrobe into one of the dark corners. I sing the song of flight. The dolphins leap through waves, they swim through sunlight, and now I remember. What this needs is a saxophone. I'm going to phone Mookie Saunders, unless A, Mookie is dead, or B, I don't own a telephone. So it's into the living room for a look-see. Oh, um, there is a naked girl sleeping on my couch. She appears to be no older than 15, extremely bad legal news, and she is snoring lightly. Her hair is a golden color and it spills around her. It cascades onto the floor. I will cover her with the green blanket, which has likewise tumbled onto the living room rug. The girl suddenly sputters and twists her arms into the air. She makes an odd sound, yeah, and her legs begin to kick in a petulant way. Then she opens her eyes, one of them at any rate, the right, and sees me with the blanket held out in front. She is in the middle of another odd sound, Oof. But she breaks it off in order to smile at me. How lovely of her. She smiles at me, digs her tiny fists into eye sockets. She says, good morning. Attire, say I, is one of the hallmarks of civilization. She is yawning. You should talk, she mentions in the middle of her yawn. I am without bathrobe. I wonder where it might be. So Desmond then goes to the kitchen, fixes himself some stale already half-eaten jelly-filled donuts, and then Claire says, Hey man, is this any better? The formerly sleeping girl has put on a pair of panties. They are almost invisible. I can see little curls of hair pressed like flowers in a high school yearbook. Her small breasts are bouncing because this formerly sleeping girl has become very animated. So, she asks, do you have any coffee or what? Do I have coffee? I support the country of Colombia almost single-handedly. Look in that cupboard, I say, through a mouthful of donut. She opens it, whistles through her teeth, and announces, coffee. The girl sets about preparing it. Make lots, I tell her. I'm not supposed to have any. Okie dokie. Do you think she might be some sort of housekeeper? I've had them before, although they have tended to be much older and stouter creatures, Teutonic, more given to the wearing of clothing. The girl has freckles all over her body, little bits of sunlight. Where do you come from? I ask. Toronto is her curious response. I love the way the book opens and how we move through Des's mess of a mansion with him and move through his memories. And the seamless transitions in the book are really wonderful. And one minute we're, we're with him in the present day and he's coming upon these bizarre discoveries like a naked girl in the living room and a kitchen full of jelly-filled donuts. And then the next moment we're in another room in his mansion and we're transported back to an earlier time in his life and slowly a picture of him begins to form and we get a sense of, of uh, his desperation and his confusion about the state of his life. 
So that's our introduction to Des Howell. And shortly thereafter, we discover his penchant for inebriates. And here is a passage that describes that love. I've overdone it on the coffee. My fingers are shaking so much that they miss the keys. Black clam notes tumble into the whale music like leaves and twigs into a pool. This is not good. To calm myself, I need, for example, a librium. Not that I have any. If a doctor in California prescribes so much as an aspirin to Des Howell, I believe they snatch away his license, no questions asked. Or perhaps I could do a toke or two. I seem like the kind of guy who'd have some grass or hash, don't I? It's just a matter of finding it. Now, if I was me, where would I hide drugs? Taped to the underside of a toilet tank lid? Hidden in a dirty sock? In hollowed out books? None of this sounds like me. A guy like me would leave his dope lying around. Probably, and this is just a wild guess, lying around on something like the living room table. What Paul Corrington is skilled at um, doing in whale music is writing something, the life of a character that is troubled, um, disturbed, he's a recluse, but he does so with a light touch. Even if the themes are dark, and in whale music we're talking about betrayal and family dysfunction, um, the humor is not just on the surface, it is, it is shot right through the manuscript. It's the gold that we dig for when we're, when we're, when we're reading. That ability to, to be funny while um, dealing with very dark material to find that balance is, is one that Quarrington has and, and shows in this novel. Des Howell is one of um, Paul Quarrington's brilliant, flawed narrators. Um, I'm very fond of the idea of the flawed narrator, the person whose mind you don't really understand, whose opinions you don't really trust. As a literary device, the flawed narrator is excellent because it keeps the reader guessing. You don't know how much you can trust him. And at the same time, Des is one of the most engaging guys. So you really like him, and you can't quite trust him. That, that makes for great fiction. Desmond is a multi-instrumentalist. He plays all sorts of instruments, and one of his favorites is the keyboards. And here is a section that describes his love-hate relationship with one particular keyboard called the Yamaha 666. The Yamaha 666. I think they may have gotten in over their heads when they invented this particular beast. There's a rumor that Stevie Wonder is having trouble with his machine, which probably means the Yamaha 666 is chasing him around the house. We are the only two people, as far as I know, who own a Yamaha 666. They cost many hundreds of thousands. Except for a studio in Glendale, which purchased one and burned down that same night. The Yamaha 666 gives forth another reverent snarl. That it isn't plugged in means nothing to the Yamaha 666. The keyboards, seven of them, are curved and cantilevered. They produce an enormous pool of shadow. But as I take a cautious step forward, a light flashes from within the darkness. The Yamaha 666 emits another sound, gentler this time, almost a purr. The light flashes again, a reflection off glass. I stumble quickly towards it and find, perched on the middle keyboard, one entire bottle of bourbon. As I pick it up, a little tube of paper rolls forward, water falling down the keyboards, and before it has hit the ground, I've recognized it as a joint, a number, a bomber. Now we're set. I mean to wash the humanness out of my system, then I can work on the song of congregation and get it right. I think the Yamaha 666 likes me. That's what I think. I love it that he talks about Stevie Wonder in this passage. And, and there are several passages in here where he refers to musicians, like there's, there's a part where they're sharing a dressing room with the Beatles and they get into a huge brawl. And it's great because these are obviously musicians that I know and love, that we all know and love. And he talks about them as if this stuff has really happened to them, as if Stevie Wonder really does own a Yamaha 666. 
it's like you can kind of relate to him. And I also love that he is this former rock star that is working on this opus that is non-commercial. And the record companies are always bugging him to do something more commercial that they, and also um, they own him for life, that he has a completely exclusive contract that he can never get out of. And uh, I have to say I can relate to those things. They're very accurately described in this book. And uh, the music business is a very interesting business. The music side of it is, of course, wonderful. And the business side of it is, is not always so wonderful. And he captures that very well. One thing I find pleasurable about whale music is the idea of um, a writer writing about um, another sort of artist, which Corrington has done here. He's writing about a musician and a musician who has succumbed to creative urges and everything else just falls away. And it's um, fascinating to me to think about how much Paul Corrington was trying to get at his own experiences as a writer trying to create and, and what that's like and the vulnerabilities involved there. This is about mixing and reverb. This mixing is a sticky business. Working with echo is like working with quicksilver. It's impossible to keep hold of the stuff. It slips through your fingers, it spills onto the floor, it's messy and sloppy and generally a pain in the butt. However, it has to be done. Echo is a little piece of galactic space. It's god wrought and beautific. It shades the higher frequencies of the Yamaha 666's unearthly caw. As a musician, I often find it hard to read books about music. There aren't too many authors who get it just right. Often the metaphors are not accurate, and therefore, as a musician, you read it and you just you're too concerned with the fact that it's not accurate to, to enjoy it or get what they wanted out of it. And if it's too accurate, then it's, it's fine for a musician to read, but it would be far too dry and boring for someone who wasn't a musician to read. So it's a fine balance. And Paul Quarrington is one of the writers that really does get it right. So as all of this music making is going on, Desmond is finding himself more and more attached to this Claire, this young woman that he found in his house at the beginning of the book. And uh, he realizes that she's not an alien or an apparition, which he thought at the beginning of the book. He thought Toronto was an alien planet, which I quite like. So now here's another passage describing his continuing relationship with Claire as she becomes a good effect on him. I must speak with Claire. I check poolside, she is not there. I go to the living room, she is not there. I check the kitchen, she's not there. I hope that she hasn't fixed her Starcraft and zoomed back to the planet Toronto. I am howling. How could I, the fat phantom, have gotten myself involved in another legal imbroglio? I climb the stairs, huffing and puffing, and hope that Claire might be in the bathroom or bedroom. She is in neither one. She has disappeared. Perhaps she never even existed. Did you ever think of that? I will go to bed. Bed going can be rather radical with me, you know. At one point, I climbed into the sack and didn't emerge for close to a year, other than hurried and furtive trips into the bathroom. Mind you, I was indulged by my egocentricities back then. There were people who would bring me food, for example. Judging from my weight, there was a whole army of little ants. Still, I can probably live off my subcutaneous fatty tissue for a month or two, which might be enough to do the trick. You have no idea, really, how big a deal bed going is in our society. It's a sad thing when a person's normalcy is established upon the regularity with which he or she scurries under the blankies and launches into Never Never Land, but sad things abound. If you eat three squares a day and clock in the requisite eight hours nightly, why then, you could collect shrunken heads and no one would bat an eye. Yes, it's true. Take it from me, a veteran. The indicators of mental health in this fair land are sleeping habits, hair length, and beards. Those doctors hate to see beards, especially long ones. It makes them antsy. A beard and long hair, they reach for the constraining garments. 
If you have a beard, long hair, and stay up late, why then, they shoot the drugs into you. Not the fun drugs, but the dark, lugubrious ones. The drugs that make you go blah, blah, blah. Of course, if you walk around going blah, 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 you're mentally ill. Checkmate. I take a few steps. I lift off and deposit the girth on the mattress. This is not good, and I'll tell you why. There is a scent, an odor. There is a sweetness here that certainly has nothing to do with me. Claire was no apparition then. She existed, and now she is lost to me. I tossed the pillows angrily across the room. There was a sect of monks who bedded down on nothing but dirt floors, and they achieved spiritual enlightenment. I'm not willing to go quite that far, but I can do without pillows. The theme of whale music is so simple um, that it takes you a little while to realize how much is in fact going on. Des is a, a hermit, a recluse, uh, and the idea is simply to bring him outside. And everything in the book relates very strongly to the one strong central theme, bringing Des out. Uh, everything in The Lord of the Rings relates to throwing the ring in the fire. That's the plot that drives, you know, 1,500 pages of narrative. Everything that happens in whale music happens to bring Des out. We want him to find a way to get it together, and I think that's one of, uh, one of the great appeals of the novel, um, is, is our um, rooting for Des. We finally see him take a step um, literally out the door and literally into himself, but also he's now taking a step um, into confidence, into, into being who he is. So he's taking, um, figuratively, he's taking that step forward as a character, and we see him growing. A terrible thing has happened. Claire and Desmond have had a fight, and Claire has since disappeared. So Desmond is realizing how attached he's become to Claire, and he is about to do the unthinkable. The reclusive Desmond is about to go out into the world. So, it's down the golden hallway, platinum too. In my youth, I was quite the rock star. And laying my hand upon the doorknob, which feels icy cold, into the, now is the time to bolt if ever a time there was. Now is the time to race upstairs, climb into nappies and scurry between the sheets. Real world. Talk about your bright sunshine. That orb is suspended about 30 feet overhead. It's giving out with a Tarzanian yodel. My eyes, even hidden behind the Polaroids, shrivel into tiny annulated beans. And hot, phew, it's like the sun has grabbed me by the collar of my makeshift smoking jacket and is demanding, what did you do with the money, huh? Still, my eyes will adjust in time and a few flaps with my arms direct a soothing breeze across my chest. My front yard is ruinous. Three or four species of weed are battling it out for possession. The only competition coming from garbage. Empty liquor bottles stud the lawn. I have vague recollections of pitching dead soldiers out of windows, hoping to outwit Farley and the misses. But I likewise suppose that my yard has become a nocturnal hangout for alcoholic transients. I don't care. What's the difference between me and an alcoholic transient? Several million dollars. Ah, you remember ah, don't you? The idiosyncratic little kecking sound I make when deeply distressed. I make it now because what has appeared from around the side of the house but a snarling dog, fangs bared and hackles raised. It is a small dog, an unruly collection of mottled cowlicks, but its teeth are pointy and its eyes are red. I give out with a little, nice dog, good dog, but this mutt is too intent on its yawping to heed me. Then I say, excuse me, do you realize that I am Desmond Howell? I own this house. I don't remember retaining you. And if I did in some drug and or alcohol induced state, all agreements are null and void. Now, I beg your pardon. Curiously, the dog falls silent. It is quite the silliest hound I have ever seen. Its eyes are crossed, its tongue hangs out almost a foot, it is splay-footed, and the fur on its paws is too long by several inches. I haughtily step by it and stumble on my way. 
Even with shades, I seem to be blind as a mole. I must hold my arms out and describe wide circles with them, lest I run into the black iron fence that contains my property. And already I am sweating. I haven't got ten feet. This expedition was a bad idea. How about a nice, refreshing flop in the pool? How would that be? But then, you see, what happens is... The mere thought of the pool conjures up an image of Claire poolside, her buttocks presented to Phoebus like an Incan offering. I must keep going. I've never really been comfortable with the word genius, and you get the sense through the book that Des wouldn't be comfortable with that word either. But I think if, if Des Howell had moments of brilliance throughout his career, then Paul Quarrington must have had moments of brilliance in creating a character like Des. Lots of books have music as a backdrop, or has music, have music as part of the story. Uh, certainly rock and roll music, uh, part of the story. To me, the two best ones, uh, the best novels about rock and roll, are uh, Roddy Doyle's The Commitments and Paul Quarrington's Whale Music. Whale Music got the Governor General's Award in Canada in 1989 and is um, unique in Canada for being a novel about rock and roll. It was called by Penthouse the greatest rock and roll novel ever written. So that was Whale Music. I love this book so much because it combines reality and fantasy together in a really interesting way. Plus it's hilariously funny and at the same time it's really emotionally engaging and deep. That's why I love Paul Quarrington.